Welcome. Thank you for choosing to listen to another word-filled message by David Entry. Preaching is the means by which God manifests his word and nourishes our spirits. May the life of God enter into you and you as you listen to this message. Be blessed. First Peter chapter 3, from reading from verse, verse 10. For he that would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, let uh, and his lips that they speak no vile, no guile, sorry, let him eschew evil and do good, let him seek peace and ensue and, and it. For the, eye, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That is a strong one. It's against them that do evil. Uh, and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness, for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as Evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good con- conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, thank you so much once again. Thank you for joining me. And I believe that God is going to do something great in our lives. Last, in our previous teaching, I spoke about how you want to see good days, good life and see good days. Uh, First Peter chapter 3 from verse 10 says that you want to see, uh, for he who love life, you love life. Don't just endure life. Don't, don't hate life. Don't be tired of life. Don't, don't coast in life. Enjoy life. Love life. If you love life now, love life doesn't mean be, being materialistic, but living life in its fullness. He says that he, I have come that you might have life and more abundant. Uh, 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 John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal but to kill, but I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, living life to the fullest, fullness, all right? So he who, who love life and see good days, I prophesy to you that there are good days ahead of you, amen? There are good days ahead of you. How would you see good days? Have a good day. How are you going to see good days? There is a way. There is a path. You will see good days. Good days ahead of you. He said, if you love life and see good days, you must eschew evil. Uh, you you, uh, you must um, refrain from uh, refrain your tongue, his tongue from evil. There are some things that should never come out of your mouth. And it slaves from speaking guile. There are some things you should not speak. Guile. It's It's... It's bad. It's offensive. It's not glorifying to God. It's it's not edifying. There are things that a Christian should not speak. Or let me put it this way. If you want, why is it that I'm a Christian, but I'm going through all this? I'm suffering. There are things that you should make sure, boxes you you have to make sure you have ticked. And you'll be led by the Holy Spirit and helped by the Holy Spirit to take those boxes. One of the boxes, if you want to see good days, if you want to see good days, then you have to refrain from speaking evil and your tongue from guile. It is, it's, it's, it's a necessary condition for seeing good days. <laughs> it's not everything you can say and still see good days. There are some things you cannot say. Why? Because you are working some good days. You are building, you are developing good days. Hallelujah. Because you are developing good days, you can't say everything. And some evil can never proceed out of your mouth. In spite of how much you are pressured or you come under pressure, evil shouldn't proceed out of your mouth because it will compromise the good days and better days ahead in the name of Jesus. So he said, if you see good days, um, uh, refrain your tongue uh, from, uh, from evil and your lips from speaking girl. Verse 11 talks about how let him eschew evil. Eschew is abhor. No, this is not right. There are some things you can't condone and allow around you or endorse. No, I can't do that. It's everywhere. Some, some things you, you say, no, this, this is not right and I cannot accept it. I cannot endorse it. I cannot support it because you have to eschew evil. Shun evil. 
shun evil. Let's see how the Amplified puts it in the verse 11. The Amplified puts it this way. It says that, let him turn, turn away from wickedness and shun it. You have to, no, this is not, this is not for me. Shun it and let him do right. Do what is right. Do what is right. So whether it's by the law, the law of the country, or law in your home, or your, your um, relational laws, or the word of God, the law of God. So don't say, I, mean, I just believe I obey the word of God and other things are not important. If actually obeying the word of God makes you do what is also important and what is right, what is good. So it says that do good, eschew evil, shun evil, and do good. Do good. We must be do goodness. <laughs> we believe this. Every Christian must be known for good, good works, must be known for good behavior, goodness, kindness. Do good, Christian brother. Do good, Christian sister. It's part of it's called Christianity 101. Do good. Do good. Do good. Don't just speak in tongues. Do let people know you to be a good man, a good woman, a good guy. They must say about you, he's a good guy. Uh, that, that no, he's a good guy. I, I just don't like his preaching, but he's a good guy. <laughs> I, I don't like his beliefs, but he's a good guy. He's a good guy. They, yeah, they must say, you're a good guy. They must know. Even if they don't want to accept it, they, they must be hypocritical to say you are bad. Because they know in their heart you're a good guy. Do good! So he said, do good and eschew, eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. I'll amplify. Let him seek peace and ensue it. He said, let him search for peace, for harmony, for undisturbedness from fear, agitating passions and, uh, and moral conflict. No, we, don't, we don't want all those things. Either. And seek it eagerly. Do not merely desire peaceful relations with God, with your fellow men. Okay, so do not merely desire peaceful relation with God, with your fellow men and yourself, but pursue it, go after it. Don't say that I'm hoping that one day it will be okay. Our, our, my relation with my, my, my brother will be good. I'm hoping that one day my relation with my, my, my wife will be better. No, don't sit down and wait. Go for it. Pursue it. Chase, chase it. King James, a new King James puts it. He said that let him seek peace and Verse the new King James and pursue it, chase, run after it. Don't wait for it to come to you. Your estranged relationship with your brother, with your sister, with your, your daughter, with your son, with your mother, with your father. Do something about it. Do some, some relationships are worth keeping, others are genuinely worth not keeping. It will destroy your life, but some relationships are worth keeping are uh, worth maintaining and satan always likes it when there's discord amongst bro- brethren so you must not be contributor of discord among people and you yourself when there's discord between you and somebody you have to do what lies within your power bible says as much as it lies within and actually uh, romans chapter 12 as much as it lies in your power be at peace with all men Thessalonians says it, Romans says, as long as it lies within your power, as long as it's within your power, some things will be, be, will be beyond your power, but as long as it's within your ability, if it is possible, as much as it lies in you, live peaceably with all men, New King James, live peaceably with all men, live peaceably with all men, NIV, as much as it depends on you, you see that if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, so long as you are concerned, live at peace with everyone, not only your friends, but everyone. Live at peace. This is this is this is good. Do good. As long as it lies on you, live at peace with everyone. Be at peace with everyone. Hallelujah. We are we are we are enjoined to be at peace with everyone. Enjoined as long as last with some people, it doesn't matter what you do, they will still hate you. The the dancing skills 
of the rat never impresses the cat. <laughs> so some people, it doesn't matter what you do. They, they just, they, you are their enemy. But Bible says that as long as it lies within you, as long as it lies within your power, you are living in a home with family, with people. Be at peace. You are sharing a, a room with your fellow students. Be at peace. As long as it lies. Be, be a peace seeker. Seek peace. So pursue it. Pursue it. Pursue it. Desire to have a good relation with people and pursue it. That's what the scripture is telling us um, here. So it says that let 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 him eschew evil and do good. Let him let him eschew evil and do good. Um, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue. Look at verse twelve. For the eye, I like this. Why should you pursue this? Because the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. This is the second time prayer, potential possibility for answered prayers are being mentioned in this uh, first Peter chapter three. First one is verse seven. It says, handle your wives well, live with them well as vessels of grace so your prayers are not hindered. Prayers. Verse, verse 12 has also now made reference to prayer that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. He's looking on you. He's keeping an eye on you to reward and honor you. So the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears, not only the eyes, his ears are also, watch this, are, are open to their prayers. That means that the ears of God are close to some people's prayers. When people tell you when you are born again, that's all. You are perfect in your spirit. Your behavior doesn't matter. Tell them that the devil is speaking through them. Because he said, the righteous. Righteous, this is, there's two types, taught on there's two types of subjective righteousness and objective righteousness. This one is telling that, talking about objective righteousness. Those, uh, the eye of the are open to the righteous. Because remember, in the context, he's talking about doing. Look at the verse. Verse 11, doing good, pursuing, uh, eschew evil. How can you be a Christian and comfortable with evil? And you say, oh, as for me, I'm perfect in my spirit. Uh, you say, when you are born again, you are perfect in your spirit. When you are born again, you are perfect in your spirit. And it doesn't matter what people, whatever you do, you can just sin going around fornicating like a fish, <laughs> messing around, doing anything you want. And guess what? Jesus is fine. Jesus is just fine with it. That is, that's, that is the devil, Satan. When you, anyone who speaks like that, listen to them, look very carefully in their mouth. Spiritually, you see the double tongue. It's like the, the, the tongue of the snake. It's Satan. Satan will always come. Did God say? And they will twist scripture. Bible talks about these people twist scripture. They twist scripture. Uh, second Corinthians, uh, yeah, second Corinthians chapter 217. It talks about we are not of those who peddle the word of God for profit or twist. And it talks, in fact, there's a place that talks about they twist the scriptures to their own heads. That's different from the second Corinthians. The second Corinthians chapter two talks about uh, chapter two verse 17 also. And then chapter four verse two also he said that we, 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 we handle, we don't handle the word of God deceitfully. There are people who handle the word of God to suit their personal interests, their personal agendas. Bible calls them a stomach they, they, they are God, their belly is their God, Philippians 3, 3 19 or so. They said, for we are not, we are, we, we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but of sincerity, uh, but of, uh, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God. We line, right? And then another scripture talks about how there are people who twist the word of God to their own heads. Okay. So yeah, this, this is the one, oh, second Peter, right? Yeah. Also, um, speaking of them and things that so to, uh, to understand which on uh, which untaught, you see, untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of scripture. They twist. How can it is unheard of in scripture that anybody can say when you're a believer, you can sin. Come on, we are judged by our works. We are saved not by our works. We are saved by his works. We are judged by our works. For everyone who stand before the truth, that uh, appear before the judgment, is called, it's called 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of whatever you have done in the body. Come on. 
Come on, come on. He said, I know your works, but I, 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 I said, I have something against you. Revelation chapter two and chapter three. He kept telling them, I know your works. I know your works matter. Don't let anybody deceive you to say, because you are born again, what you do doesn't matter. Grace covers you. It's grass teaching. This is kind of grass, grassful grass teachings. <laughs> they twist the word of God. They are unlearned. Bible says they are untaught and unlearned. Oh, the doctrine. Some of this doctrine they teach. You know, now let me show you. It doesn't matter what you do. You are perfect in your spirit. Oh, yes, you are perfect in your spirit. But every perfect spirit will manifest in the, in, in the living. In your conduct, Peter focused a lot. I don't know why don't you people read the Bible in this context and truly with an open heart. Don't go and project your belief on the Bible. Go and read out of what people do in theological terms is called a exegesis. They read into the text instead of exegesis, reading out of the text, break the text and extract what he says. Like I was teaching the other time about when he says that. Um, when people revile you, don't revile. When they uh, are evil, don't represent evil, but rather blessing. Now, no normal human being will want to keep that one and uh, 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 take it like that. Because naturally, you want to hurt people when they hurt you. Uh, Lex, Lex uh, uh, Talionis, when I said the Lex Talionis, you uh, eye for an eye, you hurt me, I'll hurt you, but it's natural. But here, it's, it's, there. it's there. Sometimes someone does something bad against you, and you really want to rail cases. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. First Corinthians 4, 12. How we shouldn't do that. First Corinthians 4, 12. It says that, and we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being reviled. When they revile us, we are blessing. Hey! Whoa. I don't know. Some places you, you, you this this gospel you, 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 won't, you won't preach it. But if you are going true to God's word, you have to let God, let God be true and every man be a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let's stick to God's word. So it, it's, there, there's a heavy emphasis on conduct in scripture when you are born again. There's heavy emphasis on conduct, not only feelings. Most people are Christians by feelings. No, come on. Feeling Christians are not true Christians because it says that the, <laughs> those, the time is coming when the true worshippers shall worship him in spirit and in truth. You are worshipping him based on the text. What you see is how you live. So let me say this again. Don't let anyone deceive you to say your behavior doesn't matter. In the first place, when you are a genuine Christian, anytime you sin, you feel uncomfortable. Anytime you sin and you don't feel uncomfortable, it's a sign that you're actually not a Christian. It's a sign that you're actually not a Christian. Or if you once used to feel uncomfortable, that means that you have backslidden so much, your conscience has been seared spiritually. So there are people who were once born again and now are living in sin and it doesn't prick their conscience. No, but if you are in fellowship, it says that if we, if we, <laughs> first John, I don't even know, first John chapter one, he said, if we say we know him and we walk in darkness, we lie. The point I'm making is that in <laughs> first John chapter three, he says that whoever sins is of the devil, it's so clear, is there. First John chapter three, verse five to eight. Anyone who sins is of the devil. <laughs> whoever sins is of the devil for he has been sinning from the beginning whoever sins is of the devil okay so coming back to the, the uh, what i'm talking about he says that the eyes of the lord are upon the righteous and the righteous is in the context of our behavior because they do good shun evil so then he goes on to talk about for the right uh, verse 12 why why should you shun evil and do good because the eyes of the lord are over the righteous the righteous will do good the righteous will shun evil okay and his ears are all attentive to their prayers but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Come on, doing evil brings the face of the Lord against you. Whether you are born again or not, or born against. When you do evil, he said the face of the Lord is against you. It's against you. That's why every believer must repent if you sin. Repent. We can't say we are sinless. But we have to repent anytime we are caught in sin. It says that I write these things to you that you do not sin, just in case you sin. First John chapter 2, verse 1. But in case you sin, we have an advocate. So who with the Father, Jesus Christ, our advocate. And let's say that these things are right unto you, that you sin not. And if 
any man sin. That means you can be a believer and you can sin. All right. We have an advocate. So you have to repent and Christ will speak on our behalf. If you fall into sin, it doesn't mean, it didn't say when you sin. It said if. That means that by chance it happens. When is it going to happen? If it's maybe. So we are. It, it, you are not a faultless human being when you are a believer. You can sin. You might, you might sin against God. And when you sin against God, repent from your sins. All those hyper grace, all those hyper grace messages and stuff, it is a way to cover up sin in people's life. Anyone who is overstressing on grace, who oh, it doesn't matter what you do, there's most of them, there's sin in their life. There's sin. There's something they're hiding, which they are preparing. One day if it comes out, they have, I keep telling you that. There's sin in people's life. People, see, you can't preach right, pure righteousness if there is, you are accommodating sin comfortably. You can't preach it. <laughs> so, he said that, let him eschew evil and do good, for the eye of the Lord is over the, the, uh, upon the righteous. The ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them. Uh, uh, verse 11 and verse 12, it talks about how we should do good. That's very important. Because you know that it's very difficult for people, for the world to hurt people who are good. Yeah. It's difficult for the world to hurt people who are good. When you are kind, when you are compassionate, when you are a good person, it's hard for the world to hurt people who are good. It's, it's very important because what you have to, we have to understand is that we are always under surveillance as Christians, surveillance in the society, surveillance at work, surveillance at home. People are interested in, you said this, what you, we want to see who you are, your, your real you, your real behavior. So don't let us be soft on misbehavior. We shouldn't be soft on misbehavior. Zero tolerance for sin in your personal life as a Christian. The whole world lies under the sway of the evil one. In First John, I've gone back to it again. First John chapter 5, verse 18. He said, he who is born of God, said, we know, verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Does not sin. That's where there is, does not practice sinning. It's like you are sinning comfortably. Say, oh, you are not born of God. That is why you are, I put it to you. You are not born of God. Verse 3, chapter 3, it says you are of the devil. That's why you, <laughs> I'm telling you, let me repeat it. You are of the devil if you continue practicing sin comfortably. You are of the devil. The fact is you are not born of God. You are not actually born again. You can be born again and continue living in sin comfortably without any breaking to your conscience. You, it's a sign that you are actually not born again. You are not born of God. And in First John 3, it said you are, you are of the devil. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so um he said that um yeah so people cannot uh, we are under surveillance people are watching us our behavior and our behavior is supposed to bring honor to God. People people have a hard time hurting good people. Remember this. People have a hard time hurting good people. A good life is hard to harm. A good life is hard to harm. When you are actually a good person, people may not like you because you are a Christian, but they find it very hard to easily hurt you because you are a good person. And that is what he's trying to say. He's trying to tell us that goodness is profitable. Hello, my Christian brother, my Christian sister, you live with people in the house. Being good is profitable. You, you live in a neighborhood. Being good is profitable. You are in an institution with others. Being good, you should be known as the good guy, the good guy. Being good is profitable because when you are good, people find it hard to harm you. That's what the verse 13 is saying. That's what the verse 13 is saying. The world is slow to hurt people who are who are benefit to, to society. The world is slow to hurt people who are benefit to society, who are good, who are helpful, who are compassionate, who are kind, who are caring, who are merciful, who are generous. The world is slow to hurt people like that. The world is people who easily hurt you. So the, what, what he's trying to say, let's be good. And the, when you are good, 
you make it very difficult for people to easily attack you and hurt you. That's what profitability in goodness. Being good is profitable for a Christian. Being good is profitable. Some people are very hateful, annoying. So where there's even no problem, people who could have helped you bend backwards to help you, they are not interested. They actually have over enforce the law. They are in power. They over enforce the law to hurt you to know that you you are so arrogant. We want to prove something to you. It shouldn't be like that for the Christian. In other words, you 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 should people who don't like you when they want to do something to help hurt you, they find it a bit difficult because this guy, no, this guy is so good, you know. This guy is so kind. This guy is so nice. That's your story. That's your story. That's also part of the Christian journey, okay? Christian testimony. Not only receiving money, receiving breakthrough, receiving marriage, receiving blessings. All those things are good. But don't let us focus just on that and leave the other things on down. This is also fundamental. It tells us very clearly that we should be good people, good citizens, good neighbors, good wives, good husbands. Good brothers, good sister. Yeah, your brother is a, a, a thorn in the flesh. But be good. You should know that you're a good person. Your sister is a thorn in the flesh. You should know you're a good person. Be good. And when they hurt you, be quick to forgive. Be quick, quick, be quick to let it slip in dog's line and say, no, don't worry, bro. Let's get on. Let's go. No, no. I know what you did. But don't worry. I won't pay you back. I won't pay you evil. For, you know, you must be that kind of person. And when we do that, look, the verse 13 says that. And who? And who is he that will harm you? If ye be followers of that which is good, who, who, who is he? Now, this is a rhetorical question. It's not asking for uh, asking for answer. It's trying to say that so it, it has two ways, double edge. I will explain it. One is when you are actually that good, people don't find it easy to hurt you when you're that good. But on the other hand, too, he's talking about it doesn't matter how much they try to hurt you, right? They can go beyond a certain point. In other, Jesus put it in this way. Look, puts it this way. Sorry, Luke chapter twelve, verse four and five. He said, "Don't be afraid of the one who is able to destroy your body, and is not able to throw you to a, a, your soul, destroy your soul. But rather fear the one who is able." So he said, "I say unto you, uh, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. That's all. For, how far can they go? Only the body. And after that, uh, have no more. Uh, I, I, and after that, have no more than uh, they can do." Verse, verse. Verse five, but I will, uh, but I will forewarn you, whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, uh, after after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yeah, say, I say uh, yeah, yeah, I say unto you, fear him. So he said, how far can they go? They can persecute you and destroy, you, take everything. It can just, it's it's only skin deep. It can't go far into your eternal security. So he says that. Well, they are trying to hurt you. How far can they go? In some some fifty six verse three, he said, "When I'm whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you." We, we, but look at the verse four, some fifty three. Look at verse four, very powerful. He said, "In God, in God, I will praise His word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? How far can? What 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 would you do? What would you do? You can you can you can't take away my eternal destiny. The worst thing is you can." harm me physically but that's the best you can do that's the, the worst you can do that's how far you can go so it says that who will be really be able to uh, harm you they, they are harming you is limit it's limited it's restricted in isaiah chapter 8 verse 12 i like that when i saw it two days ago when we were reading uh, three days ago i read isaiah I saw, oh this is such a blessing he said do not say a co- do not say a conspiracy concerning all that these people call a conspiracy nor be afraid of their threats, nor, nor be troubled. Now, said what they are threat, the threats they are meeting out against you, don't let it, don't, don't be afraid of it. Now, that word, don't be afraid of, um, uh, uh, of do not be afraid of their threats. Give me the, 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 the um, NIV. Let's look at the NIV. Yeah. Do not fear what they fear. Okay, and do not dread it. So what they fear, what they call fear, and the things that they fear, that's what they will normally use to try and threaten you. And he said, don't be afraid of what they fear. Don't be afraid of their threats. Their threats, what they know can threaten you. Okay, they will take away your job. You will not have, 
He said, they fear, they fear. How can I lose my job? But he says that if you are doing the right thing, don't be afraid of what they fear. Don't be afraid of their fear. They define fear like that, but that shouldn't be fear for you. Don't be afraid of what they're afraid of. Don't be afraid of what the people who don't have God are afraid of. Don't be afraid of it. That's what Peter was quoting from Isaiah chapter 8. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of their fear. So he says that, um, Verse, back to First uh, Peter, and who and who is he who will uh, harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if watch this, you see that's very interesting. But and <laughs> but and if you suffer, that means per chance. Because watch this, I want to say something and bring something to your attention. Um, number one, we have to be willing to. Uh, to suffer for Christ. But number two, we have to, so number one, we have to be prepared to do good. We have to be, do good. But number, number two, we have to be willing to suffer for Christ in the sense that <laughs> first, second Timothy chapter three, verse 12. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 12. <laughs> it says that all those who live, yea, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus, what happens? You suffer. Persecution is part of the deal. So people will like you, okay? Because you're a good person, people like you. But it's, it's, it's eventually, eventually, they'll, they'll, they'll turn against you, yeah? The world will, tr- will tolerate you, but not for long, yeah? Eventually, persecution is inevitable for the, the one who lives godly. Because it's like somebody is in a room. Quite a few people are in a room, the room is dark. And their eyes are enlarged, so they are they are kind of okay in the dark. And then you come and turn on the light. Get out of, please get out of go go out with it. We don't like it. So it's it's not like you are that bad, but your righteous works are so of, can be so offensive. When I say your righteous work, the, the, I said this some time ago. You see, unbelievers like the church for how good we are. Do you know hospitals? A hospital is an idea of the church, started by the church. Most charitable organizations in the world started by the church. You know, in those days, in, in the Greco, Greco-Roman times, listen, women don't have rights, you know. But Christ brings poor rights and he says that in Christ there's no female or male or female. For we are all one in Christ. Come on. There's not that Greek, Jew or Greek. There's not that male or female in Galatians chapter 3. said, there is neither Jew no Greek. There is neither slave or free. There is neither male or oh, for we we are all one. Really, Paul said we are all one in Christ. You know, in fact, Peter said it. First Peter chapter three, verse seven. He says, "Your wife, husband, treat your wife well. Leave them with understanding. Honor them as heirs of grace." We all are the same level when it comes to grace. So, Christians are good, good Red Cross. Charitable organization, um, many, many organizations for alleviation of poverty. You know, wherever Christianity has always gone in remote places, it goes with education, clean water and other things. Oh yeah, Christians are good. <laughs> we are the good guys, hallelujah. We are not it. The world knows that Christians are the good guys they are the good guys and we have to maintain it let's be good but guess what they like us for the good things we do and they want to enjoy your your guys are so good until they hear our message "Ah, we don't want that message because our message says that jesus is the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except by him some people say but why are you saying that christians you are you are obnoxious or you are annoying. What do you mean by, uh, uh, you, 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 you think you are, um, you are better than every, you think your religion is better than every other religion. You guys are better. No, we are not better than the people, but we are better off because it's only Christianity that guarantees forgiveness of sin. It doesn't matter what, even if you are Osama bin Laden, even if you are Hitler, as soon as, as once you confess Christ, yippee, you are forgiven eternally. What? There's no religion that gives guarantee that can guarantee forgiveness of sins. No religion <laughs> can guarantee. No religion has got good news. 
No, <laughs> no religion has got good news. It's only Christianity that has got good news, good news. But the good news, the message of the cross is offensive to the fallen. It's offensive. It says that we preach the cross. It's, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. It's an offense to the Jews. We preach the cross. We preach Christ and him crucified. That is. It's, it's the message. It's this message. This gospel thing we don't like. It offends our heart. So guess what? People will like you. Because when you are good, you will attract the sympathy of people. You attract the, uh, the, the appreciation of people. But it will be, it will eventually, eventually will fade out because of the message. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Persecution will always come to you. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, 26, I believe that woe are you if all men speak well of you. If all men speak well of you. If you preach a Christian message, they will hate you. The Christian message is come to Jesus and be saved. Come to Jesus. We cannot deny the message. We can't deny the message. And so, as long as we we hold dear the message, we will face persecution. But so, when you are good, you attract good good will of people. But the truth is, just in case the, your good will not be good enough, it will remain good enough because your message most of the time. People with a certain heart will turn against you because of your message. When they attack us, it shouldn't be because of we are broken law and we have been nasty and we have been un un unpleasant people. No, when they attack us, when the world attacks us, it should be because of the message we can't deny. And the message is come to Jesus he, he, and he will save you from going to hell. He will save you from your sins. He died to save us. This is a harmless message, but the world can take it. It's a harmless message. And so when we suffer, it shouldn't be because of the wrong things we have done, but it should be because of the message, the right message we have, which Satan does not like. So he inspires the heart of men to attack us. So um, eventually, at some level, at some point, the world will persecute you. Mm -hmm. At some point. At some level, the, the world will persecute you eventually. Eventually, they, they will turn, the world will turn against you. Why? Because of your message. Because you are living for God. You are a Christian. Because you take a stand for Christ. Because you are taking a stand for Christ. Eventually, the world will hate you. Christians, be ready for it. So be ready to suffer. But do good so much that it even mitigates the amount of suffering they can level at you. But the suffering will come inevitably. Those who live godly in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3, 12, shall suffer persecution. Those who live godly. And Jesus puts it this way in the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, 11, and 12. It says that, uh, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. When men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Please remember, underline that word, falsely. Okay, don't give truth to the negative things they are saying about you. But they are accusing you falsely for my sake because of Jesus. All right, it is part of the Christian journey. People who accuse you falsely, all right, and be willing to accommodate it. And I'm going to show you from the scripture how to be able to accommodate persecution, how to be able to stand firm in times of persecution. So persecution is inevitable. So two points. Number one, be good, be eager to do good. Number two, pers persecution is inevitable. So be ready to embrace pain, ready to embrace suffering and be faithful. All right. So, um, but if, verse 14, but, but, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, please, please remember, you are suffering for righteousness sake. That is so important. I didn't actually finish reading the Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Let's go to the verse 11. We are going to verse 12. Blessed, verse 11 says, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. Verse 12 says that rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which are 
before you. Say, go back to the verse 10 again. Say, blessed are you if they persecute you for righteousness sake. It's the same thing here. It's First Peter chapter 3, verse 14. But if you suffer for righteousness sake, righteousness sake. Now, this righteousness is talking about the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of Christ, okay? He said, for my name's sake, for righteousness sake. If you go through things because of the gospel, don't be afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Don't fear. When you suffer, when they try to attack you, they can't go that far. They can't go one because you are good. And sometimes they are not free to easily harm you. That's one. But the more, more strong part is because he said, Sam said, I, can, I shall not fear. What can man do? It can't go any far. They will threaten you, threaten you. They can't throw you into hell. At worst, they'll put you in prison or try and kill you or try and harm you. But they are harming you will go only to a certain level. But you are eternally secured and your eternity is guaranteed. Hallelujah. So that's what he's saying here. If they be, be willing to suffer persecution because persecution or suffer because persecution is inevitable. So um, um, be eager to do good works because good works are profitable. Be willing to so, uh, be, be, be willing to suffer because persecution is inevitable. And then the third point, verse fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Wow. Sanctify. What does that mean to sanctify the Lord God in your heart? It's the same thing that was repeated or it's quoted from Isaiah chapter eight verse thirteen. We read it earlier on. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Sanctify the Lord. God of hosts himself. What does it mean to sanctify? To sanctify means to set apart. All right. So I have my notebook here and I, I want to give a lot of gifts here, but this one is I set it apart because this one, I can't give it to anybody. I, don't, I can't give it to anybody. It's my special note. So the other ones. So in other words, set, separate Jesus from any other thing. So don't mix it because you are suffering. Don't add Jesus to all because the ways the other time you suffered for uh, your in your career, you suffered uh, with your health, you suffered. So now the Christ too. No, Christ is not one of the normal. The suffering that comes to Christ is not. Don't normalize it. To don't compare it to other. Se sanctify Christ. Separate Christ. In other words, this is very important. In other words, you are so determined that Christ remains your Lord. In, uh, in spite of what happens. You are so determined, Christ is your Lord. Christ is your Lord. Now, in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, and then Acts chapter 10, verse 36, it all shows that Christ, Bible says that, Acts 2, 36, therefore let the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, watch this, both Lord and Christ. He's both Lord and Christ. Some people are willing to have him as Christ, but not as Lord. Lord means that the one in charge, your life is under his control, his management. So he is both Lord and Christ, not just Savior. He's Lord and Savior. Don't be happy to have him just as Savior, but not as Lord. No, he's both. Did you see that word? God has made him both. He must be both else he is not really working in your life. He must be both in your life, both Lord and Savior. So he said, sanctify Christ as Lord or sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Sanctify this Lord. And Acts chapter 10 verse 36 says that the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. He either is Lord of all or not Lord at all. So it's one of these two. He's either Lord of all in your life or he's not Lord at all. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. So you can't say he's only Lord about that, about that. But when it comes to the things that, uh, you know, this is how I do my things. He's not Lord there. No, he's Lord of all. So he said, sanctify him, sanctify the Lord. In other words, Stay, oh, 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 I like this. Thank you, Jesus. Stay focused. Keep your focus on Jesus. In spite of what you are going through, keep your focus. Don't say, now I feel so discouraged. I don't even feel like going to church. Please, please sanctify Lord in your heart. Don't bring Christ into your personal issue. And because you are discouraged, now you even feel like, I don't want to read my Bible again. Sometimes you might feel like, you might feel like that, but you have to sanctify the Lord. 
Sanctify the Lord God. Separate him from all other things that happen in your life. He is exclusive. Whether you go down or you go up is not a condition for who he is in your life. So who Christ is in your life has not got anything to, to do with your living conditions, human conditions, nothing. You just sanctify him. So focus on him. Whatever that you are going through, everything that is happening, they are persecuting you. You just focus on him. You just you don't even say, Jesus, why am I going through this? You say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You've been so good to me. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate you. When you go through things that don't make sense, that is hurting, that is disappointing. Don't be questioning Jesus. Sanctify him in your heart. That I know you always do right. If there's something that has gone wrong, then it's me. All the wrong that has happened, I take responsibility. All the beautiful things, the good things, God, I give you the glory. I give. Sanctify him in your heart. Don't make your commitment to Christ conditional. Don't make your commitment to Christ and his church conditional. Don't make your commitment to Christ and his church conditional conditional don't make because he's lord of all make him lord of all sanctify him in those days in the times of the roman of uh, uh, powers the uh, uh, first century christianity those times you can stand anywhere in town and scream and shout jesus is god jesus is god and you find you find saying jesus is god you're fine why because they believe in many gods. So this is God, this is God. They may say, okay, that's a new God. Uh, tell us. That's why in the Areopagus, Acts chapter 17, the Mass Hill, the philosopher said, we've seen you talking about this new Jesus. Tell, what, tell us because we want to know. We want to know about this God you are talking about because they believe in many gods. So you're also bringing a new form of God. Well, we are welcoming to new for every form of God you bring. Once is God, fine. So in those days, you can say Jesus is God and it won't be a problem. But when you say Jesus is Lord, Jesus Jesus. Hokurios, Jesus Hokurios, Jesus is Lord. That is not because Caesar is Lord. If you say Jesus is Lord of all, you are going to get into problem, into trouble with the authorities, with, with Caesar, because Caesar is the only Lord. Caesar is the only Lord. You can't say Jesus is Lord. And the early church, their confession is Jesus is Lord. So in Philippians chapter chapter 2, it says, verse from verse 9, For therefore, wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name, that is above all names. That at the name of Jesus, at the name, but that, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and every uh, uh, of those in those in heaven, of of those on earth, uh, those other verse eleven is the one, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I be, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of the heavens and the earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. <laughs> our Lord. Lord means the boss, the one in charge, the ruler, the one who whose word is final. Lord, our Lord. And He says, "Sanctify the Lord God in your heart." sanctify so he says that when you go through don't be afraid but sanctify instead of being afraid of their fear don't fear their fear okay don't fear we don't fear their fear we don't fear their fear we don't fear in fact i think in philippians chapter 1 verse 29 or 28 i think chapter 128 it says that in nothing being terrified by your adversary wow i like that one and in nothing is that in nothing uh, and not in any way Okay, King James. And in nothing terrified by your, don't be terrified by your adversary, which is to them an advent, uh, 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 an advent token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. He said, in nothing, uh, New King James, New King James said, and not in any way terrified by your adversary. They can threaten us. They can threaten us. They can us, twenty with your job, with your marriage, with your with your finances, with your house. How? Oh, come on, sanctify the Lord, God in your heart. Don't be terrified. Don't be threatened. Don't fear the fear. Don't fear the fear. The Lord God will help me. Therefore, I shall not fear. What can man do? Don't fear the fear. Don't fear the fear. Don't fear that. Fear God. Don't fear what they fear. Fear God. Fear God, and don't fear what they fear. Hallelujah. So instead of fearing, he says, sanctify the Lord 
God in your hearts, deep inside you, not just in your actions, not just in church, the way you dance, the way you sing, not the way you behave in church when everybody's around. But the thing is not just on the surface. This thing is deep in your heart. It's deep. It's coming. Uh, uh, it's coming, coming from the, your inner man, from your depths. You sanctify God in your heart. You sanctify God deep in your heart. They can't take him away from your heart. This thing is a hard thing. It's not just on the surface. It's a hard thing. Let me just move on. So sanctify God in your heart and be ready. Be, be ready always to give an answer to every man. Every man. Be all, be, and, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. This is so good. Be ready. So this is how you live your life and have better days and good days. <laughs> how to have good days. Do good. Do good. Refrain from speaking evil. And be willing to embrace suffering because persecution is inevitable. And then uh, sanctify God or focus on Christ. Focus on Christ. Focus on Christ. Sanctify God in your heart. And then the, the next point is um, you must have a reason. So it's not just a feeling. You must know what you believe. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he said, Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed because I know in whom I have believed. Please don't ignore the word. Uh, nevertheless, don't ignore the word. No, I know. Cognition is a mental exercise. There's no feeling. It's not a feeling issue. Right. It's not a feeling. Don't build your doctrine around your feelings. It must build around what you know. So he said, I know in whom I've believed. You must know. You must know. So he says that, let me go back to it. Be ready always to give an answer. Now, the, the phrase translated, give an answer, the Greek word translated an answer. In fact, let, look at the New King James. New King James uses defense. The New King James uses the word give defense. Okay? So give defense. The same I think NIV will use defense. New American Standard will also use defense, right? And then um, uh, yeah, New American Standard uh, give an account. So that's a very important one, an account. In, in Acts chapter 22, verse 1, you know, Paul said, men and brethren, fathers, hear, hear ye my defense. So he was a court. We are Christians. You are always, the world is a court. And you are always to give, uh, Christians are always on trial. Yeah. The world is a court and you are always on trial. And you have to be able to give a defense. To defend, what are you supposed to defend? That's very important. We are not defending our church. We are not defending our where we live. We are not defending even our behavior. We are defending what is the core competence of our behavior. The driving force behind our behavior, the driving force behind our approach to life, what is it? Our hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our hope. So keep that means that keep your eyes on your hope and have a reason why you have that hope. So that anytime anybody asks, it doesn't mean you have to be a theologian. The Greek word translated defense or answer is apologia. Apologia. That's the Greek word. Apologia, which you get the word apologist from. Apologies. When they say someone is an apologist, someone who gives defense and gives answers, a defense for uh, the faith, defending the faith, an apologist. All right. And when you say apologia, it's not necessarily going around apologize. I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. It's rather you are. You must be able to defend why you are a Christian. Yeah, defend it why you are a Christian, based on the hope of eternal life, because we have a forerunner. Our forerunner has entered in for us. There is a for our hope goes behind the veil, beyond the veil. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. Our hope enters within the veil where our forerunner has entered for us. Our hope, the Christian hope, is like an anchor. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters 
the presence behind the veil where our forerunner Jesus has entered for us. He entered there for us and has become a high priest according to the other man. So we, we, our hope, it calls it the blessed hope. The blessed hope is a blessed hope. one day Jesus is coming. And when he started first Peter, when he started writing first Peter chapter one, it talks about we have a living hope. Verse 3, a living, he has begotten us again. He has given birth to us unto a living hope. We have a living hope. So people will ask you the question about the hope that is in you. Verse, uh, verse, verse, uh, first Peter chapter 1, I think verse, verse 13 said, Set your hope on the grace that is to be revealed. Set your hope. This hope, set your hope. We have hope. Set your hope. Set your hope. He said, get up your the minds of the Lord, be sober, and hope to the end. And the other translation said, set your hope on the, the grace that is to be revealed. Set your hope fully on the grace that is to be given. When Jesus, our hope goes. Paul in Philippians, Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse Verse 6, 15, 16, 17, it talks about how I pray for you that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of it, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that ye may know the hope. It starts with the hope. You got to know the hope of his calling. When he calls us, this calling comes with hope. It's a living hope. It's a living hope. Christian walk. Is it? A hopeless Christian life is an oxymoron. Hopeless. How can you be without hope in a Christian? Christian, the strength of what we do is hinged on the hope we have. Hallelujah! The glorious hope. The blessed, Bible calls it the blessed hope. The blessed, Titus chapter 2 verse 13 is called the blessed hope. It's the blessed hope. The, it's the hope of our calling. It's the hope of our calling. The blessed hope is the living hope. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And this hope goes beyond the veil. It enters into the presence. It's not an, an ordinary natural hope. It is a supernatural. It's supernatural in nature. And so when we are Christians, we are we, we are people of hope. We are hope goes beyond. And he said, when people ask you, you don't have to be a theologian to defend. Now that apologia means that being able to defend at a law court, like what, what Paul did, he stood at court and defended it. That is apologia. And then, so formal, both formal defense and informal defense in your day to day life, your friend asks you, why are you behaving like this? Or why are you so nice? Why are you such a good person? Why are you always in church? Why you should be able to, you don't have to be a theologian, but you should be able to have reason, reason, not feeling, reason. There must be a reason behind what you do because of your hope in Christ. There must be a reason behind your giving, your tithing, your worshiping, your servicing, your serving, your sacrificing, your forgiving others, your behaving in a certain way, your evangelism. There must be a hope behind it. And you must be able to give the reason. It doesn't have to be deep. It doesn't have to be deep. Whatever you are and you do as a Christian, then you must be able to just give basic under explanation, biblical explanation, reasonable explanation. What we say must be reasonable. Hallelujah. It must be reasonable. So it must be the, uh, practically reason. Uh, uh, there must be a practical reasons. Practical reasons for what we do and they are beneficial. All right. So we must have practical reasons for where, what we do. The world is a courtroom. We are always under trial. Christians are under trial. To see good days, we must be ready to defend. What in, because they are determined to um, talk us out of it. But we must be ready to defend. Wow. Hallelujah. Having good conscience. I think I will end on that. Having good conscience that whilst they speak evil of you as evil doers, they may by uh, they may be ashamed that falsely they see the false accusation is false it's false it's false they are they may have good conscience first timothy chapter oh Acts chapter 23 verse 1 paul said men and brethren he said I, I earnestly beholding the council he said men and brethren i have lived in all good conscience before god until this day in chapter 4 Chapter 24, verse 16, he says, I do everything. I exercise myself in this thing. This is how I exercise to have always, always have a good conscience or a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. 
good conscience towards God. When you are doing something in your heart, you know. Some people will just do it because it looks okay. But deep in your heart, there is a difference between um, good conscience and good feelings. Good feeling. When you are sick and you go to the doctor and maybe there's a problem or it's corona, he says that you have corona, but just feel good. You will just go and feel good. No, treat the corona. Treat the sickness. Guilt. You can't feel yourself out of your guilt. Oh, I'm fine. I don't. No, you, your conscience, your conscience will not let you off the hook. You have to be able to sort it out and have good conscience. And when you are born again, one of the things you get, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, is that the, he, he purges us to have good conscience by the blood. He said, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from good work to serve. Them. It does something to your conscience when you are born again. Your guilt is taken all care of because he actually forgives you. You don't have the right to forgive yourself. In other words, I pronounce myself forgiven. <laughs> you have offended somebody and you de declare yourself forgiven, whether they like it or not. I no, no, you don't have that right. No one has that right to declare themselves forgiven in spite of what? The word offended is only God who can pronounce us forgiven. And we have to serve God with a good conscience. I don't think I want to go too far uh, any further. We have to serve God with good conscience. Bible says that holding faith and good conscience, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, which some having abandoned have made shipwreck of their faith. Holding faith and good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Verse 5, verse 5 says that the end of the commandment is this, charity, love from a pure heart, and a good conscience and faith. Good conscience is a necessary aspect of Christian work, where deep in you, you know before God, and what you are doing is right. It doesn't matter. People will say, oh, that's okay, you're fine, you're fine. But you know, is it right between you and God? Between the things you are saying about that brother, the things you are saying about that sister, the things you are practicing, they are saying it's okay, it doesn't matter. But but within you, someone say, okay, you can masturbate, it doesn't matter. But you, 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 between you and God, you. So conscience, you have good days. You will see good days and love life in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to this message by David Entry. To hear more from David Entry, follow him on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. You can also subscribe to Caris Church on YouTube. Don't forget to share and subscribe to our podcast so you're always up to date. Be blessed.